Right. Looks like we're all set and ready to go. Well, thank you so much for being here. So many people. It's it's. We're very glad to see so many people at the last network seminar of the uh, term. We'll be back in uh, uh, Trinity term starting uh, uh, April 25th, probably. Uh, today's speaker is Sonia Kefi from the uh, Evolution Sciences Institute in uh, Montpellier in France. She's also a member of the external faculty at the uh, Santa Fe Institute. She was the recipient of the Elder Trainee Prize back in uh, by the uh, Network Science Society back in 2020. She's a world expert in ecological networks and applying network science to uh, the study of evolution and ecological systems. And today uh, she'll be talking to us about the uh, uh, stabilizing or destabilizing ecological system and all of her uh, mathematical modeling approaches and as well as data-driven approaches to tackle questions in this, in this domain. Uh, Sonia, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting your, uh, our invitation and well, welcome to the Network Seminars. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you all for being here. And thanks, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, so I'm an ecologist. And uh, from what I understand, uh, it's a different field um, from what most of you are doing. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll find some of this interesting. I might spend too much time explaining things that are kind of obvious to you or not explaining terms that you're not familiar with. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, I guess then Nicola might need to come and, and, and speak uh, to the computer. I don't know, but uh, because I might not see hands if you use the, the online system, but don't hesitate to interrupt me. Basically, if you have, if you have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, yes, I'm checking if this is working. Oh, wait. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm generally interested in the stability and resilience of ecological systems. And some, um, what are the mechanisms that allow ecosystems to adapt to changes? And this is a question that has uh, always been present in ecology, but it has attracted increasing interest uh, since the raising awareness of uh, global change. And indeed, it is in a context of change that all the ecosystems we're so crucially depending on are dynamically evolving. Interestingly, despite all these changes, in many ways, ecological systems seem incredibly stable and resilient. Ecosystems recover all the time from extensive droughts, wildfires, disease outbreaks, and natural disasters. And one of the very obvious testim testimony of that is um, how nature is reclaiming sites that have been abandoned by men. But at the same time, we also have ample evidence that um, ecosystems can respond in dramatic and sometimes irreversible ways to perturbation. And I'll give you now an example of um, a case that I've studied during my PhD. So this is the picture of a dryland site. Um, drylands are ecosystems where water is the most limiting element for life in general and for plants in particular. And this is what we consider as being a healthy site. So it has a relatively abundant vegetation, a relatively species rich community. But now if you walk a few hundred meters um, that direction, this is what the same ecosystem looks like. At least it used to be the same ecosystem. And what you see is that the vegetation cover is much lower. You might see a difference in color of the vegetation because the species composition is different. Uh, this system is, uh, has a much lower species richness. And also you see those um, erosion features on the soil. Basically, the only difference between those two sites is that they were owned by different farmers. And this one uh, has been overgrazed at the beginning of the 20th century. It was um, those two sites were grazed by goats. And so the, this site was overgrazed. And um, within a few years, it changed from that state to that one. 
And the thing is that species that became dominant in that new state of the ecosystem is not palatable. It's not uh, edible by goats. So the site was abandoned. Farmers had to leave. leave. And um, we have evidence that the site hasn't been grazed for at least 70 years, and we haven't observed a spontaneous recovery of the ecosystem. So this is a nice example, I think, um, of a case where an incremental change in a driver, in this case grazing, led to a dramatic response of the ecosystem with important ecological consequences because the species composition of the site changed, but also economic consequences because farmers had to leave. So understanding what determines the stability of ecological systems is not only a fascinating challenge of the field, but it's also a major concern if we want to preserve ecosystems in the current context of global change. But addressing that requires, first of all, to define what we mean by stability, and especially uh, specify how we can measure it. So the oldest paper I know of um, that discusses the quantification of stability of eco in ecological systems is a paper published in 1969 by Richard Leontin. And in this paper, he um, introduces the concept of neighborhood stability. Um, so basically, um, this is the potential of the system, or in ecology, we use the term stability landscape. And in this stability landscape, wells represent attractors of stable state. And the x-axis here is an ecosystem state, for example, total cover of vegetation in the ecosystem. And in the case where the stability landscape has a single well or single stable state, we expect the ecosystem to come back to that um, attractor or stable state following any type of perturbation. But what is interesting in that paper is that Richard Leontin mentions at the end of the paper that according to him, one of the most interesting questions in ecology is whether ecological systems can sometimes, under certain range of conditions, exhibit alternative stable states, meaning if the stability landscape can have several wells. In uh, which case, perturbation can push the system from its current state to um, the basin of attraction of the other stable state. And this is the framework that is um, used to explain transitions in ecosystems such as the one I presented um, previously. So imagine that again, this is vegetation cover. So you have um, two possible attractors of the system, one where vegetation cover is relatively high and one where vegetation cover is relatively low. And a change in grazing pressure pushed the system from its a high vegetation cover state to a much lower uh, vegetation cover state. In another very important paper that was published a few years later, Buzz Holling um, suggested that we could actually use different terminologies for the cases where the stability landscape has a single uh, stable state and the cases where the system can has can have uh, several st uh, stable states. And he suggested that we could use the stability, the term stability for local stability analysis. So for quantifying the stability of a single attractor, and we could use the term resilience to think more generally about um, the stability landscape and how many attractors a given system can have. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about terminology in the literature and people have suggested to use different terms, but in general for this presentation I'll, I'll um, use stability to refer to local stability analysis and resilience for studies that have investigated um, whether the system can have several attractors. And these concepts, um, they are quite intuitive, I mean we can, we can describe them, define them using those stability landscape as a kind of metaphor. But for them to be useful in practice for investigating um, ecosystem response to change, we need to be able to measure them. And we need to be able to measure them in models and in data. And so a while ago with some of my colleagues, um, we got interested in trying to figure out 
what has been done in the ecological literature so far. So how have people quantified stability and resilience in ecological systems? So we performed a literature review um, and we searched for papers um, studying either stability or resilience um, from the 50s until um, to 2018 in a number of ecological journals. And we retrieved a bit less than a thousand papers which we read and for which we um, recorded a number of elements, um, the type of study, whether it's theoretical or empirical, the number of species um, of the system that was studied, the type of perturbations that was investigated, and in particular, what metric was used to quantify stability or resilience. Of course, we only kept papers which measured either stability or resilience or both. And this is uh, what we found. Um, overall, across all the papers we investigated, we found 40 different stability and resilience metrics measured in all these papers. And we made sure that um, we recorded the definition used for each of these metrics. So sometimes terminology was not consistent across papers, but we made sure that those 40 different metrics are actually 40 different metrics. And here I plotted the number of different metrics measured each year um, through time. And what you see is not only have stability and resilience been quantified with many different metrics, but we keep inventing new and new metrics. So the number of different metrics keep increasing through time. Just to give you an idea of what these metrics are, one of the typical things people measure, especially in data, is temporal variability. So imagine you have a time series of, um, of a state variable. So let's say abundance, so biomass. You can measure the temporal variability, the variance of the time series. Recovery is whether the system after a post perturbation, whether the system comes back to its original state or not how long it takes to recover, so what people call the symptotic uh, stability. Resistance uh, quantifies after a press perturbation, so a perturbation that is applied on the system and maintained. How far is the state of the system displaced compared to its previous state? And people have also looked at how many alternative stable states they are. This is just, just a few examples to give you an idea of the type of things people have measured in data and in models. And so the conclusion of that literature review was that stability and resilience are multidimensional concepts in ecology. And this is not new. A number of previous papers had already stressed that issue, including this uh, quite famous paper from Grimm and Vissel um, published in 1997. So we've known that for a long time. The question is, is that a problem? Is that actually a problem that in ecology, we measure or we use those two terms, stability and resilience, to refer to a number of different metrics. Well, uh, I'm sorry, is, is there a question? No, sorry, it was I'm just sorry. someone who uh, wasn't, wasn't muted, now is muted. You can go on. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so is that a problem that we measure stability and resilience with that many different metrics? Well, first of all, it prevents comparisons among studies. Studies from, for example, different ecosystem types, but also comparisons between theoretical and empirical studies. And actually, um, if you look at the metrics that are typically measured or used in, in theoretical and experimental studies, they're typically different. And so this raises the question of whether these metrics measure actually the same or, or different things. In other terms, are those metrics correlated with each other or not? What my colleague um, Ian Donohue refers to as the dimensionality of ecological stability. In simple terms, imagine that we're interested in three different stability metrics, uh, variability, robustness, and resistance. If the three of them are very strongly correlated with each other, it means they're highly redundant, they contain the same information, 
And measuring one of them provides information about the others. So in that case, the dimensionality of ecological stability would be low. But if they're not correlated with each other, it means that they measure different things and quantifying or assessing the stability of the ecological systems actually requires measuring these different um, metrics. And then the dimensionality of ecological stability would be high. So what's the actual dimensionality of ecological stability? First of all, do we have information in the literature that allows us to answer that question? So I've looked in the in our literature review, I looked at how many metrics are typically quantified in a single paper. And what you see is that most of the papers measure a single metric of stability or resilience. And um, actually, 92% of the paper measure either one or two. And it means that very few papers quantify more than two metrics at a time in a single paper. And this means that currently, based on this, um, on the literature, we don't have information to answer that question. So stability and resilience are multidimensional concepts, but our understanding of them is not multidimensional. So how are stability and resilience metrics correlated with each other in ecological systems? Well, with um, a former postdoc, Virginia Dominguez Garcia, we try to address that questions in mathematical models of ecological communities. So the idea is we're going to model um, com ecological communities uh, that are trophic communities. This means that species are connected by feeding links, they eat each other. We're going to apply perturbations to these communities. We're going to measure a number of stability metrics. And eventually, we're interested in quantifying the correlations among all of these metrics. So that's the general idea. Now, more specifically, um, we build traffic networks, so food webs. And to do that, we use the niche model, which is a, a model that allows um, to build realistic structures of uh, food webs based on the number of species and the connectance of the network. So you, you give um, the number of species and the connectance of the network, and it's an algorithm that creates a um, skeleton of a, of a food web that has a realistic structure. And so we analyze networks that have between five and 100 species, and we do that for more than 10,000 networks. Now, we have a skeleton of a food web, and what we do is we map a dynamical model on top of that skeleton. So we are going to um, add a, a system of ordinary differential equation on top of this. So it means um, every node will have a dynamics, a temporal dynamics. And we use a model that is quite classical in the ecological literature that is called a bioenergetic consumer resource model. And I'll just give you a quick uh, view of it. So imagine that Bi is the biomass of species I. So you have one equation for each node of the system, for each species. The biomass, uh, the dynamic of the biomass of the species I grows um, because the species um, grows if it's a primary producer or eats if it's not a primary producer. And you have a loss, loss terms because species can be eaten and they are loss terms due to metabolism. It's the basic idea. And um, the important terms here, the F functions, uh, multi-prey holding type functional response. They're functions that describes how much a given species eats depending on the abundance of its prey. And uh, basically it's a nonlinear saturating function. What's interesting with this model that again has been quite widely used in the literature is that once we have the structure of the network, we can estimate um, almost all the parameters of this model using allometric scaling. So this means that if we know um, the average um, size of a given species, we have we can use data from the literature to have a realistic range of values for each of the parameter of that model. So it's very convenient. We can we have an algorithm to build a structure, and then we have a way of having um, realistic ranges of values for the parameters of the model. <clears throat> 
Now, starting from random initial biomasses for all the species, we can run the temporal dynamics of the, of the model. And then what we do is we apply a number of perturbations. And we apply three types of perturbations to the model. We apply um, press perturbations. It's, um, I don't know if this is something that is common outside of ecology, but we call a press perturbation a perturbation that is maintained through time. A post perturbation is an instantaneous perturbation, something that occurs and is released. And uh, noise is just white noise added to the, to the biomasses of those the species. And then we measure 27 stability metrics, stability and resilience metrics on those networks. And uh, we chose those metrics because they were found to be the common ones used in our literature review, basically. So I'll go a little bit more in detail, I'll give you some examples of those stability and resilience metrics. So for the response to post perturbation, we quantify uh, what is called reactivity, which is the initial response of the system uh, to the perturbation. So it's how fast the system is moving, is initially moving away from its current state. We measure what is called maximum amplification, which is how far the farthest the system uh, moved away from its um, initial equilibrium. The time to maximum amplification, which is how long it took the system to reach that maximum amplification. And we measure um, what is called the asymptotic resilience. It's how long it took the system to recover to its um, equilibrium after the perturbation. So that's kind of long-term response of the system, whether reactivity is really the initial response of the system. Now we also measure what is called stochastic invariability. So it's the response of the system to white noise. And what we want to know is, is the noise amplified by the system or not? And finally, we measure the response of the system to a number of press perturbation. We measure how the system responds to an increase in um, mortality, which can be an increase in mortality of one species or of all species simultaneously in the system. Tolerance, for example, is how much do we need to increase mortality before at least one species goes extinct? And resistance is if we increase mortality of 10%, how much is the total biomass of the system displaced? We also measure um, response to species extinction. So tolerance to extinction is how many species do we need to drive to extinction before the whole community collapses? And robustness is if we remove one species, how many secondary extinctions occur in the system? So this is just to give you an idea of, of a number of metrics we look at. Okay, so once we do all of that, we end up with 27 stability metrics for our more than 10,000 uh, networks. And this can be represented as a network where the nodes are stability metrics and the links are the pairwise correlations uh, between those metrics. Now, what we want to know is, again, how correlated with each other those metrics are. And more specifically, are they groups of metrics that are very strongly correlated with each other, so they're very redundant. And so to address that question, we use um, community, a community detection algorithm based on, on modularity. So when we calculate the modularity of that network, uh, what we find is that we have three different groups of metrics in, uh, for these simulations. And actually, you see here, there's like three metrics that are in gray. Because I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we study networks that have a wide range of sizes. So some of the networks have five species and others have up to 100 species. So actually, we looked at how... Um, the community detection was sensitive to the number of species in the network. And it turns out that those three groups are relatively um, robust to the system size, but those three um, metrics in gray, they're attributed to one group or the other, depending on the size of the network. So we keep them in gray because um, it's not really clear what group they belong to, at least it depends on system size. But the other three groups are very stable. And so what we find is that these metrics here in yellow, 
they're a matrix that measure the initial response of the system to a pros perturbation. So that's reactivity, maximum amplification, time to maximum amplification. This group in green is a group that quantifies response of the system to press perturbation, basically after press, how far the new um, state of the system is compared to before the press. And this blue group here, which is the largest group, combines the response of the system to all type of perturbations. And it basically measures a distance to some kind of threshold. At least that's how we, we the best way we found of characterizing that groups. And it's, for example, how many species do you need to drive to extinction before the whole system collapses? Or how much do you need to increase mortality before at least one species collapses? So it seems that those three groups, they make intuitive sense to us. And interestingly, the correlation between metrics from different groups is quite low, it's 0 0.1. And this means that these three groups of metrics are weakly connected to each other, suggesting that metrics within a group can be considered as largely independent from metrics in other groups. So if you quantify stability based on a metric from one of these groups, it doesn't provide much information on the stability based on the other groups. So these can be considered a, as kind of independent stability components. So this would mean that there is basically three ways of being stable or unstable in these um, food web systems. So to end this first part of my talk, stability can be measured by many metrics. And some of those are actually very strongly correlated with each other, forming what we consider to be three relatively independent stability components. So stability and resilience are multidimensional concepts, but their dimensionality might actually be quite low. And I think this, this opens very um, promising perspectives in terms of simplifying the way uh, we can measure stability and resilience in ecological systems. But of course, there's a number of open questions. For example, how do these results depend on the specific model we use? So here we use that bioenergetic consumer resource model, which is quite convenient and quite well known and studied in the ecological literature. But what happens, how sensitive are the results to the details of that model? For example, to the shape of the functional response or, or some values of the parameters used in that model. Also, um, in that model, we model feeding interactions between species. So it's a, it's a network of, of feeding links of a single interaction types. And we may wonder how networks of different interaction types could, could lead to different results. So if you study a mutualistic community, would you get those same three groups? And maybe even more interestingly, if you start combining different interaction types in, a, in an ecological network, so you have feeding plus competition plus mutualism, then would that affect the correlation between the metrics? Also here, we decided to work on a subset of metrics that are those 27 most frequently used um, stability metrics in our literature review. But what happens, what would happen if we add additional stability and resilience metrics? How would that change our picture of the correlation among the metrics? Also, I think one of the weakness of this study is we used a very correlative approach, statistical approach. Um, so we, we perturbate the network and then we quantify those correlations and then we apply those modularity um, algorithm. But we lack a mechanistic understanding of the relationships. Some of, a lot of those metrics are derived based on the dominant eigenvalue of the, the dynamical system. And so we expect some of those metrics to be related to each other by construction, by definition. Other uh, correlations emerge from um, the dynamics of the model. And it would be very important, I think, to get a better understanding and knowledge of which of those correlations are expected based on the, 
the mathematics um, and which of those correlation are really emergent from the dynamics of those ecological systems. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues, um, Jean-Francois Arnoldi, who's a mathematician by training and works in, um, in Moulis in the south of France, um, he has started investigating some of those expected uh, relationship between stability metrics. So for example, in that paper, they show that um, reactivity is always expected to be smaller than um, um, stochastic invariability and that the asymptotic resilience. So he shows that there are some relationships between stability metrics that are expected by construction. So coming back to the two broad concepts I introduced at the beginning of the talk, so the local stability versus resilience framework, uh, let's look at how those two um, frameworks have been quantified in the ecological literature. So here you have the number of papers that measure at least one metric related to st the local stability um, framework that are related to resilience or the alternative stable states framework and that quantify both. And first of all, what you see is that most of the papers in ecology quantify metrics related to local stability analysis. And this is true in theoretical studies here in red and in um, empirical studies. Now, Fewer studies have um, quantified metrics related to alternative stable states. And what I find very interesting, although not surprising, is that very few studies actually quantify metrics related to both local stability analysis and alternative stable state. It's not surprising because we've seen that actually very few studies quantify more than one metrics in the ecological literature. So, very few studies um, have the possibility of quantifying metrics related to those two um, approaches. But what I think is very interesting with this is that it, it illustrates very clearly that those two approaches have developed into independent research lines in ecology. Since the early papers of Buzz Holding in 1973, people have considered these as two different worldviews in the ecological literature. And they typically position themselves as either um, with either a local stability analysis uh, state of mind or an alternative stable state slash resilience uh, vision of ecological systems. And as I mentioned in my um, early examples on, on drylands, the alternative stable states um, approach is interesting in the context of global change because we would like to know whether and when ecological systems can collapse and if those responses uh, can be irreversible or not. And um, so it would be interesting eventually to succeed in reconciling those two different approaches. So let's, in this last part of my talk, let's talk a little bit more about this alternative stable states framework. I've been interested in quantifying how species diverse, how complex are systems that um, address uh, systems in studies that address the alternative stable states approach. So here what you see is how many species, how many papers um, address um, study systems with um, <laughs> what level of species richness. So what are the size of the systems studied? And what you see here is that the vast majority of papers study systems that have one or two species, so very species poor uh, systems. So what this shows, and there's of course very practical reasons for that, but this shows that our current theory of alternative stable states in ecology is very low dimensional. And again, it's very interesting for us to figure out when those scenarios of alternative stable states can emerge in natural systems. So in the low dimensional system, we actually have a very good understanding of how alternative stable states can emerge. And I'll give you a very quick um, 
idea of that. So there is one key mechanism that we know um, can promote this type of behavior. So if you look again at the landscape, a dryland landscape, you see those vegetation patches. So plants are aggregated in space and they form these vegetation patterns. And if you zoom on those patches, what you see is typically some species that we call nurse species that are adapted to the dry, rough conditions of um, arid ecosystems, drylands. And those species, they create a microenvironment close and below their canopy. And this microenvironment, it facilitates many other species and allow species that are not as adapted to the rough condition of drylands to survive in those ecosystems. And this is the reasons why plants aggregate in drylands. Now, if we go to the uh, very simple models, if you model a plant uh, consuming water, what you typically find is, um, if you look at the stability landscape, it has a single well. So there is a single stable state. And so if you look at the bifurcation diagram, imagine that here I'm plotting the equilibrium state of the system as a function of a stress gradient on the x-axis. So imagine the ecosystem state is biomass or total cover, vegetation cover. What you see is something like this, so gradual decrease in ecosystem state when stress increases. But now if we add a facilitation mechanism, so plants increase the availability of water. So imagine below the canopy, there is less evaporation and there is an increased infiltration rate of water in the soil. So plants promote the availability of water in the system. What we know from a number of, of theoretical studies is that for a range of conditions, the potential can now exhibit alternative stable states. So the coexistence of stable states with high and low vegetation cover. And if you look at the um, bifurcation diagram of the system, it now transforms into something like this. So here again, you have the equilibrium state of the system as a function of increasing stress. The, equilib the stable equilibria are um, the solid lines. And what you see is there is a range of conditions here for which a system can be in two alternative stable states, so either high cover or low cover. And so if the system is on that upper branch and pushed because of increasing stress, like increasing grazing or increasing aridity, the system can shift from that state to that lower state. Also, interestingly, once the system collapsed to the low state, um, if you decrease the, the pressure, the stress, it doesn't immediately recover to the previous state. You need to, to move all the way to that other tipping point for the system to recover. So there is a, there can be a relative irreversibility in that case. So just to, to um, conclude on this, in ecosystems, we know that in some ecosystems, we know that, that key species are involved in facilitation mechanisms that contribute to positive feedback loops that can promote the emergence of alternative stable states. But again, um, this is based on very low dimensional theory. And this raises the question of how do alternative stable states emerge in complex ecological networks? And actually, we know very little about that. But I'll mention one study from Yele Lever and colleague um, published a while ago in Ecology Letters, where this, they investigate um, the dynamics of poly plant pollinator communities in a mathematical model. So imagine um, you have plants that are pollinated by pollinators, and so you have a mutualistic um, interaction, so mutually beneficial interactions between both. A pair like this follows the dynamics that I described earlier with alternative stable states. Now let's imagine that you increase the complexity of the system and you don't only have one plant and one pollinator, but you have 25 plants and 25 pollinators. What is the probability that we see a community-wide collapse in the system? Um, so in the first case, what they do is they investigate the dynamics of that system, but putting those links randomly. So in a random network, it's a bipartite network, but the links are set up randomly. 
And what they do here is you see each color is a species, a pollinator species. And here you have a stress level, which is basically the mortality rate of uh, pollinators. And what you see in a random network is that, well, the abundance decreases and you have those partial collapses. So some species go extinct at different points until eventually everybody collapses and the community is extinct above a certain mortality level. But now they investigate what happens not in a random network, but in a nested network. Um, and what they find in that case is that you see that the, the, the point of collapse synchronizes. So you have a gradual decrease of, of the abundance until one point at which the whole community collapses at once. And so instead of having the partial collapses, you end up having one community scale collapse of the community. What is interesting is that this nested structure is typically what is fine to be a significant structure in plant pollinator networks observed in nature. So what they show with that model is that there can be community-wide collapses in mutualistic network and that their scale and nature depends on the act architecture of the ecological network. And this, the architecture, the specific architecture that promotes community-wide collapses is actually one that is often found in, um, in real systems, which is not very reassuring. So to conclude, if we want to address the stability and resilience of complex ecological systems, I think we first need to address the question of the complexity of the concepts themselves. And so we have investigated um, stability and resilience with many different metrics. And what the study I mentioned about food web models suggests is that actually the dimensionality of those concepts might not be that high, but this needs to be confirmed by other studies on other interaction types, other type of models, um, so that we know how uh, sensitive that result is. But it seems to be promising in terms of uh, simplifying the way we can measure stability and resilience in ecological systems. But on top of that, um, the ecological literature has been split into two different worldviews, um, the kind of local stability analysis view versus the resilience or alternative stable states um, worldview. And especially for the the alternative stable state or the resilience um, worldview, our understanding of how this type of behavior emerges has been very low uh, dimensional. It has in, it's based on, on systems that have a very species poor, which really raises the question as how our current understanding of the emergence of alternative stable states can scale up to more complex systems. Systems with, I've, I've talked about an example with interaction networks rather than modules of interaction, but we can also think about a spatial system. So imagine a landscape of ecosystems that are connected through dispersal of individuals, what we call a meta community or meta ecosystems. And it, if each entity can individual, individually collapse, what happens if several of those ecosystems are connected in space. How would a collapse, local collapse, propagate to the entire uh, landscape? And actually, there's a few studies that have started addressing those questions in the literature, and I think they're very interesting. But basically, I'm suggesting that at this point, we need to scale up our current theory of the emergence of tipping point in ecology. And basically, I think saying that is not very satisfying as a theoretician, because what we want is develop theory and models that are as simple as possible. But what we need to do is identify the elements that need to be incorporated in our theory so that we have a better and more reliable understanding of when and how complex ecological systems can exhibit alternative stable states and possible tipping point between those states. But this is basically an enormous task. So how, how can we explore that complexity? Yeah? Going from modules of interaction to complex networks of maybe different interaction types, 
spatially connected and so on. And I think one line of research that in the last years I've found especially promising for addressing those questions is dimension reduction. Um, there's a few papers in the literature that have shown that we can simplify um, complex ecological networks or complex networks um, in a simpler um, set of equations. Um, and you might know some of these um, papers. And actually, I think this is a very promising way to explore um, what dimension of complexities are important to incorporate in our current theory so that we can improve our understanding of the stability and resilience of ecological systems. And so with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, all my collaborators that have been mentioned um, during the talk. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Are there some questions in the room right now already? Yeah, okay. Let me just see if it's in the wall. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for such a great talk, Sonia. Can you hear who's asking the... Yes, wonderful. Um, so yeah, it seems really interesting that the um, the metric being used is sensitive uh, not only to um, whether we've got more of a local stable state or a, an alternative stable states um, worldview, but also um, the type of, pers of perturbation. So if you were talking to a researcher which says, I have this system, um, and I'm trying to decide what metric to use to quantify stability and resilience. Um, would you suggest a more bespoke kind of approach where it would depend on the kind of perturbation, or would you say, you know, try a variety? Um, you know, given what you found, how would you actually approach it for a specific system? Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope I understood. I, I couldn't hear very well but i hope i understood your question like what would i suggest for a given system what would i suggest to measure concretely in terms so i think it, um if you're interested well first of all again like the results we have is only for food webs and, and we don't know if it's something that is very robust or not but let's assume this is robust and so we have those three different groups of stability metrics that reflect three independent groups of metrics and so within a group metrics are very redundant then i would say depending on what your what the person is interested in um, let's say you're only interested in post perturbation or you're only interested in press perturbation then you can already um, decrease the number of metrics you're interested in so you know for the post perturbation you have um, one group of metrics for the press, another, and then there's this third group that combines all. Um, and then the question is, what metric you would, would you choose? Would you choose within a group? Um, and for that, I think there's first of all practical constraints. So among those metrics, some are much easier to measure in. Um, empirical systems and other are very difficult to measure, like all the metrics related to the dominant eigenvalue of the system, they're very difficult to measure in nature. Um, so then, you know, if you would want to measure something related to the blue group, blue stability group, I would suggest measuring temporal variability rather than, you know, something related to the dominant eigenvalue, for example. So I think there's constraint of the data you have, whether it's theoretical or empirical. And then there is what kind of questions are you interested in? Uh, what type of perturbation and what time scale? Because again, the, the group, the yellow group is a metrics that respond to pulse perturbation and it's the short-term response of the system. So yeah, I think you, you, yeah, you, can, you can, based on the constraint of time perturbation and, um, and the type of data you have, you can, <laughs> decrease the number of possibilities. And then if you still have a choice, um, you can go deeper into the analysis of the correlation among the metrics to see what is the metric that is the most representative of your group. And that's something that we've looked into. So you can, you can try to quantify how representative a given metric is from a given group, like how central is it or how uh, well, um, how well does it describe the, the, the variance of the the variability of the whole um, stability 
uh, I don't know if this is very clear, but basically you can go a little bit deeper in the analysis to try to figure out what's the metric that is the most representative of that group, if you still have a choice based on all the other constraints. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, uh, I hope you can hear me as well. Um, speak thanks up. for the talk. Speak up a little bit. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I have a question that's sort of like the inverse of what you, you just asked, um, where if you were to uh, try to uh, look at either the, you know, the relationship between different metrics or uh, you want to look at alternative stability and things like that, um, but from an empirical perspective, as opposed to uh, models which have to be restricted and have a lot of assumptions, um, do you think that is a feasible to do? And uh, b, you know, are people doing this kind of stuff? Are they uh, running experiments to see how different metrics um, correlate with each other? Yes. So yes. So it's of course not very easy to do um, in uh, in empirical systems, but there's a number of studies that have. Um, and um, so, for example, there's a paper from Penn and Camp, and there is the paper from Jan Donohue on the dimensionality of stability. Uh, they use data to illustrate um, those diagram of correlation among metrics. And actually, what we find them the, in the model is very much in agreement with what people have found in uh, in experimental systems. So, in experimental systems, you cannot always measure all the metrics, but you can measure a subset of metrics and um, and you can measure the correlation. And it seems that um, results are coherent so far. So, yes. Thanks. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to pick your brains. Thank you very much for your talk. That was great. I'm an ecologist as well. And I haven't looked at this stuff for quite a while. So, but I remember when I was learning about it, that there was the understanding or there seemed to be an agreement that there was in marine systems, you much more commonly found these alternative stable states than in terrestrial systems. I know the example you showed was a terrestrial system, but it, given that you've been in the literature much more recently than I have, is that still the, the case in empirical systems that these alternative stable states are more common in marine systems? But do you know why, if it is true? Yeah, I think I think that's a very good question. I don't know if there is really um, a definitive answer to that question. And um, indeed, I would say the most well understood and described case of alternative stable states in nature is probably the one of marine, uh, not marine, sorry, uh, lake. Uh, the shallow lake studies of, of uh, Martin Schaeffer and Steve Carpenter. So in lakes, I think they've, They've described and they, we understand the mechanism that generate alternative stable states very well. Um, in terrestrial systems, it's more, much more tricky for different reasons. Um, if you want to formally prove that you have alternative stable states, technically you need to observe the shift one way and the other. And so it means you have perturbation in one direction and then you have perturbation in the other direction. and and you, Typically, at least for drylands, the time scale involved are so long that um, we observed some shift in some direction. And it seems that we have a number of evidence that suggests it could be alternative stable states, but it's very tricky to formally prove that these are alternative stable states of the same type as what we observe in the models. So my answer would be for, for some systems, we have relatively good evidence that alternative stable states can occur. And the best evidence, are, of course, in in um, in the lab, in laboratory systems with microbial organisms, um, but in terrestrial system, I think we have um, a number of accumulated evidence that suggests this type of behavior are occurring. But I I wouldn't say it's a formal proof, and that um, these are real alternative stable states. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. I think we have time for yeah maybe a couple more questions, but okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I'm very interested in the dynamic aspect of uh, your model. So as you said, some of your the metrics you have mentioned depends on the uh, eigenvalues and the special properties of the uh, dynamics linearized near the uh, equilibrium point. And yes. But some others, like for example, when you show you do transition from the case where I have no hysteresis to a case with hysteresis, but 
Yeah, it seems to me that you're trying to detect a uh, common coordination clue by the patient point in the dynamic. So I'm say again, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't understand the end, but sorry. say again the last part. I, I think that looks like to me that you are trying to detect a co-dimension clue by the patient point in the dynamic, dynamical system. So I'm wondering if these things can be done efficiently in a large uh, system where you have many species and also the dimension reduction technique that you mentioned in the end. If you reduce your complex network to a much simpler motif of the original full network, are these properties, the bifurcation behaviors and the eigenality properties, are they conserved uh, when you do these re do these re reductions? Um, I'm not sure I understood. You mean if you if you work with very large systems, right. are these so properties conserved? I'm wondering if you you are reducing your large system to a small system. Yeah. Are these metrics are these dynamical uh, derived metrics preserved when you do this reduction? I I don't know. Uh, this I I don't know. I think I think it's it's it would be very interesting to figure out, um, but I I don't know. I haven't really started working on this um, reduction dimension. Um, the Gauss approach only works for mutualistic systems, and it seems for purely mutualistic systems it works very well. Um, the approach suggested by Mathieu Barbier and colleagues it 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 can be applied to any type of interaction type, so you don't need to have mutualistic interactions. Um, but then you get a stochastic uh, system rather than a deterministic um, ODE. And so I, I don't know, I haven't looked into, into the stability of this reduced uh, system, uh, but I think it would be really interesting to look into. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I, I answered your question, but feel free to send me an email if I haven't answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, maybe one more last question. I apologize again for the inconvenience. Sorry about the uh, poor audio quality, Sonia. No problem. So yes, thanks as well for your talk. Um, your results on simplifying these 27 and or more different measures to these three primary dimensions of the mic was, was, was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to clarify. So. Should we think about that in the sense that any given study system would exhibit these three things, or you think different study systems will be belong in one or other of these groups? And then if we have time, it would also be nice if you could perhaps just um, say a little bit more about how these three measures differ. Yes. So any study system you need, you mean like any biological system? Yes. Because that's a question we have. We we don't really know. Like, um, I can I can give you a little bit of an answer by telling you a bit more about what we're currently doing, um, which is I'm interested in in networks with multiple interaction types, so multiplex networks, and so the studying with food starting with food web was the starting point. But now the next question is how does including other interaction types affect those correlations and we find that it does so it means that if you add competition or if you add facilitation some of these groups of metrics they merge and some split so this is something that we're currently investigating it seems that those three groups of metrics they might be they're kind of robust to the details of the equations at least as far as we've seen so far but if you start investigating networks with other interaction types, those groups might move a little bit. Um, it's not major things, but um, like if you had competition, one group splits in two, for example. Um, so this is something that we still need to figure out, like how many dimensions or how many things do we need to measure? Um, and then you, your second part of the question was, oh yeah, how, um, how do they differ? So we have one group of metrics that is basically metrics that quantify the short term and the kind of transient response of the system to a post perturbation. So it's like, if you apply a post perturbation to the system, um, what happens right after that pulse? 
you have a group of metrics that measure specifically the response of the system to a press perturbation. So a perturbation that is applied and stays. So imagine increasing temperature, like climate change would be typically a press. Uh, pulse may be a, a fire, a flooding or something like this. And so the fact that those groups of metrics are very, the correlation between them is very low means that if you know about the response of the system to press perturbations, it doesn't tell you anything about how uh, the system will respond immediately after a pulse, right? So it's, you have a, a, the difference between these two groups is both the, the type of perturbation, pulse versus press, but also the scale of the, um, of the system response. And the other group of metrics, it combines everything. Um, so it combines metrics that um, are responses to the three types of perturbation, so noise, press, and pulse. But it specifically quantifies how far the system is from um, an abrupt change in stability, kind of like a bifurcation, but it's not really explicitly a bifurcation in every case. So typically, how far is the system uh, from a global collapse? Or how much do you need to increase um, the total mortality of the system before you have at least one species extinction? So how far is the system from a threshold at which something kind of drastic happens? Um, yes, I don't know if that answers a bit more your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, then I think maybe it's time to thank the speaker again. Sonia, thank you so much for being here. Thanks again very much to all of you for the invitation and for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. See you soon, hopefully in uh, in person next time. Yeah, see you. Are you going to NetSci? Yes, probably. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. Almost. So we might meet there. All right. Thanks, Nicola. Bye. Merci à toi. Ciao. À bientôt. À bientôt.